Hi, my name is Emily Bryant, and I'm going to do a presentation on the sophists. Um, but before we start actually diving into the material, um, there were a few definitions in the chapter that I thought would be helpful for us to go over just to be more familiar with it and to kind of start off philosophy with the right vocabulary. So the first one is egocentrism. Um, the book by book definition is holding one's ego at the center of their lives, meaning that everything is all about them, the very selfish attitudes. Um, and the time period we're looking at throughout this whole presentation is about the 4th and 5th century BC, um, focusing mainly on Athens and Greece. And just that whole area was very egocentric during this time period. Um, they even came to invent the word barbarian. Um, to mock the outsiders, so the people that were outside their realm of their selfish little selves. And so this word came to be because the stem of it was um, blah, or like our equivalent of what we would say is blah. And so they just used it as like blah, 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 blah. Um, so they were barbarians, the outsiders. Um, and back then, if you were a philosopher, you were very different, so you're in the very outside world. Um, the next definition that we're going to talk about is cosmos, and this is basically just means like the big picture, the grand scheme of things. Um, so it's the Greek term for ordered whole, so the wholeness of everything, um, and it's just m very much looking at the like entire universe of something. Um, I have here that it's the universe as an ordered whole consisting of harmonics and contrast contrasting elements. So um, everything from people to the way different cultures works, just the big picture of everything. And then its opposite would be the psyche, which is means soul. And so that's more just looking at each individual self. So combining the mind and the thinking aspect. So it's very much more just looking at the individuals. Um, and then there's the logos term, which in this case, it's a lowercase l. The uppercase l is more equivalent to a god, but the lowercase one, um, it was kind of vague in the book. It just described it as, um, it basically just means like intelligent speech, discourse, thought, reason, word, or meaning. So anything to do with just kind of intellect or um, things that require your mind, your intelligence. So those are that, that one. Um, cosmology, not to be confused with cosmetology, which I typed in at one point and very different results. Um, this means that the study of the universe is an ordered system. So it's very similar to cosmos. It's the study of the big picture. So basic principle there. And then ontology is the study of being. So that could also be similar to saying like the study of the psyche. So osmo ontology and cosmology um, are the inverses of each other, just in that the one studying the big picture and then ontology is just studying the um, individual being. So moving into some background information about this um, subject of the sophists, we have first the sophos. And this just meant the term could be literally translated as a wise man. Um, they weren't professionals and they didn't charge people to study under them. They were just very intelligent people who liked to speak their mind and people would come and listen to them. Um, they looked at people more as their friends rather than their peers. So they weren't, they had people that followed and kind of trained under them, you could say, but they, it wasn't the teacher aspect of it. They just looked at them as peers. Um, and then they focused on studying natural processes and the origin of the study of the life. So they were, that was kind of their area that they um, focused on there. Um, they used reason and observation to try and figure out how the world works. So that is a big key characteristic of the sophos, is that they used reason. So they really tried to be specific and point out why they believed what they believed and observation. So they combined the two of them. Um, 
And they kind of stood out from the rest of the crowd because they were asking questions that normal people thought had already been answered. So they were like revisiting very, not simple, but just questions that had come up that people had overlooked before. And they, like I said earlier, philosophers were on the outside. And so they got the first stereotype of philosophy, which was like the odd, starry-eyed dreamer who just asked silly questions and rambled on about it. Um, like I said, they were the outcasts. Um, people saw them as odd and unreliable, even into the third century. Um, the Romans just did not like philosophers. Um, but to them, the soul mattered more than the body. That was a big thing they stressed, was that material possessions and money, they just didn't matter. It was all about the soul. Um, so people, like authority back in the day, had said that in order to be an authentic sophos, it was to be a stranger of the world because you didn't want to be focusing on worldly possessions. Um, so they said that if there was any sophos who ever had an argument over money or ever was seen kind of fighting over that or things of this world, that they weren't being authentic, that they weren't a trail sophos. So they were very much just centered on the soul and nothing material. So Thales is one of the first Western philosophers. As you can see there, he lived a long time ago. Um, but back then, the philosopher meant someone in love with wisdom rather than power, which we will see later will change in the coming years. But so he was just the guy that loved wisdom, that was very smart and was just studying to become wiser. He wasn't necessarily m making this as a career or anything to make money off of, but so he is one of the first philosophers. So going into the sophists, um, these people really focus on nature or physics and the world of order or cosmos. The sophists were known more for being a prophet, priest, or therapist rather than people just seeking mere wisdom. So people were starting to go to them for advice and go to them to figure out these things. Um, they began to become known as truth seekers and thinkers rather than just people of wisdom, as were the sophos. These were known as the pre-Socratic age just because they appeared prior to Socrates. And they were also known as the proto-scientists because they initiated the transformation of mythology into rational inquiry about the nature of cosmos. So they were taking the myths that they had learned and kind of turned it into why does it work rather than just a myth. Um, they struggled to offer rational arguments and explanations for their views, which kind of threw their perception off from people. Then we hit another philosopher named Heraclitus, and his whole thing was that ignorance will come when we try to understand cosmos or the big picture before we can see and understand the psyche that goes into the logos. So basically you can't figure out the big thing until you figure out all the little small things that fit into that. Um, he even thought that things appear to remain the same or that change itself is unchanging meaning that everything is always changing all of the time. Um, so that was another aspect of what he contributed to this time period. Um, he distinguished appearance and reality by contrasting apparent permanence and hidden reality as well. So from what we know right now, we know a little bit of the difference between the Sophos and the Sophists because the Sophos who came first were just, they believed in the personal followers and peers, whereas the Sophists charged fees to study under them. Um, the Sophos studied the nature of things, whereas the Sophists began to study more of the human life. The Sophos didn't know much outside where they came, meaning that they were very isolated um, in their location-wise, whereas the Sophists had a wide range and they were beginning to travel places and go and experience different cultures as well. So the Sophists were the first group of people that began to study interactions between different groups of people, so they were the first anthropologists. Um, but the Athens began to see them as a threat because back in that government, only the high-ranking people born into high-class families had the um, funds and the ability to study and learn. But with these new Sophists, anyone who had money could pay them and begin learning. So they became um, just a threat to the government. Um, the Sophists also concluded that 
good and bad were a matter of preference and not a matter of nature. So they kind of, their whole thing is just, it's all based on the individual person, whether or not things are good, bad, truthful, or untruthful. So some of the qualities of the sophists included the fact that they began to uprise things in Athens and they were the first ones that charged a fee of people to study them. So while reading this, I kind of had a hard time getting my mind around a couple concepts until I actually just thought about what it would look like in our day and age. So I have little clips of what this would look like at APU. Hey Sierra, mm -hmm. do you want to help me with my accounting homework over here? Um, I would, but that's going to cost you about 35 cents every 15 seconds. I only have 34. Well, then, sorry. Another one of their qualities was that they desired power rather than the right answer. So um, basically, if they were in an argument with someone, they would choose the side that they know that they could win rather than choosing the one that was morally right or the one that they believed was right. Because they figured that unless they could win, arguing for the right reason was of no good because it would do nothing. So here's a look at what this would look like on campus. Yeah. Hey, who are you going to vote for in the floor election tonight? Well, I was thinking of voting for Maddie, but I don't think she has a very good chance of winning, so. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Maddie's nice and all, and she has lots of good values, and she'd probably make our campus life so much better. Yeah. But she's not pretty enough, and she's not popular enough, so we'll probably should just vote for Brittany because she's more likely to win because she's just popular and the sophists were also the first to take in this idea of relativism, where they believe that the truth is only relative to where that person is from and the background and all of the things that make up that person. So they were taught that each culture only believes and knows best from their own perspective, even though um, if someone travels and sees other things, they know that there's more than that. So culture relativism is where what they define as right and correct is based on the culture that they grew up in. So things that they're used to are right to them, but as if someone else is used to a separate culture, the same thing is completely different and construed in a different way than their own opinion. Hey, isn't it funny how at Viola the guys have to have two feet on the ground the entire time they're in a girls' room? Oh my gosh, I know. At least at APU, everybody can put their feet wherever they want. It's so cool. Another kind of relativism is individual, which is the same concept except rather than being shaped by culture, people are shaped by their own standards of right and wrongs. For instance, if someone has a much brighter, broader range of morals than you do, they would have a different individual relativism based on what they think is right and wrong. The sophists also believed in pragmatism, where their beliefs were interpreted in terms of whether or not that they could work. So they're very realist in that they tested their theories and went with answers that they knew could work. So Socrates followed the sophists in, if you were to do a timeline, but he had discussions with them all of the time. But the thing that was different was that they were more of a contest. They thought it was more about winning rather than he was more about the debates and the discussions. Socrates also never charged money for his service. This is where the sophists were constantly charging and making a profit out of things. Protagoras is also a sophist who was well-traveled and went outside of just Athens. He concluded that morals are nothing more than the social traditions of a society or group. Um, he reasoned that the most intelligent thing to do is accept the customs and beliefs of your own community, so kind of conform to the area in which you live. And doing that, it, you will understand that they're not universally true, but that's the way that you will function best in that area. Um, an a couple of examples are these are like you're going to dress the correct way to get a job. You're not going to go in sweatpants and a shirt. You're going to act the right way to get a date and you're going to do the good work to get a grade because you know that that's what works in your own culture. So in conclusion, the sophists helped free the Greeks to think on new, less restricted levels. They went to the whole world and opened up their 
um, eyes to that. They pursued knowledge for its own sake from a non-religious scientific method. They laid the cornerstones for the scientific study of human behavior, and they led to an increase in the democracy in Athens because they allowed all people to learn.